So good evening and welcome. Um, introductions first. My name is Kimberly Gilman and I am an enthusiastic novice weaver. Um, I've been an enthusiastic novice weaver for quite a long time. Um, even though I own like, three inkle looms, a, a tapestry loom and a newly acquired um, eight harness floor loom. Um, I still consider myself a beginner because I dabble a little in this, I dabble a little of that, and I don't know a lot in depth. But when I was still loomless and had young children and wanted to learn to weave, I came across a wonderful book called Spider Games. And in it, it talked about ways of engaging in weaving activities that were easy and inexpensive to do if you didn't have a loom, but you still wanted to have a fiber experience with weaving. And I'm also an art teacher. I teach middle school and high school art um, at the, larger, the largest Lutheran high school in the United States here in Las Vegas, Nevada. And um, so this is something that I have done with my students in school. And I'm a member of the Society for Creative Anachronism. And I have um, done demonstrations at public events um, to introduce the general public and particularly young people to historic handcrafts. And usually I do either weaving, calligraphy and illumination or dyeing. Um, because they're all very hands-on things that um, are very relatable and it's a nice way to dip your toe in the water um, and maybe excite a passion in somebody. So these are some samples of the pouches that I have woven with this technique. And I, when I teach, I'd like to start with a small pouch because it's something that can be completed within a few hours. It's very easy and approachable. And if you like it, you can size up the loom that I'm gonna teach you how to make to make a larger bag. Um, there's really no restriction on the size, only on um, your desire to work with the piece of cardboard and constantly be flipping it over. And this, I'm gonna just show off a few of my bags um, and then we'll jump into how to make your loom. Um, so this one was woven with, um, uh, just a smooth wool yarn and a little bit of a novelty yarn in similar colors. And you can see that I inserted um, a fluff on the front for fun. And it is seamless. There is no sewing involved unless you need to sew a handle onto the top of the loom. Okay. Um, this can be done with any kind of yarn that you happen to have in your stash. It can be um, as long as it's not too thin, otherwise it becomes very time consuming. This was one I made with some thick and thin hand spun yarn that I made myself and it has a simple crocheted chain handle. Um, again, some hand spun and then some commercial sparkly yarn. You can stop and start where you want. And if you know how to crochet or knit, um, this project lends itself to all kinds of embellishment. I like to, I like to knit um, a leaf design and then do an I-cord handle if you know what that is. Um, although my very first simple purse, which has long since been used and passed away um, into oblivion was done with just a braided handle. And the current one that I actually carry my cell phone and my debit cards and stuff in um, is this one that I wove in a gradient. So it's a very simple approachable way to learn how to weave. So the first tools that we're going to need are the tools that we need to make our loom. Um, so you're going to need a piece of cardboard, a ruler, a pair of scissors, and a pencil or pen. And is there anybody who needs to go get these? Okay, I'm gonna give everybody a minute to grab your supplies. It doesn't matter what size card or what kind of cardboard you're using, um, as long as it's not too thick. Um, this is a piece of corrugated cardboard and I found that single thickness card, corrugated cardboard works just fine for this. 
Um, as an art teacher, I am a connoisseur of cardboard. And while I love double thick cardboard, it's a little too thick for this. Um, but cereal boxes, poster board, the shirt that the, the pieces that come in your husband's shirts, or again, as an art teacher, the, um, the hard cardboard in the back of student notebooks, um, any kind of, of a sturdy cardboard um, can be used to make a loom. And so the first decision that you're going to need to make is how big you want to make your loom. And the one that I'm going to be weaving on as my sample is four inches wide by six inches long. So if you want to do some combination of four to six or maybe five to six or five to seven, um, I'm gonna give you a minute to mark out your cardboard and just cut a nice size rectangle or square for the size that you want to make. And since we're kind of a small group, um, when you're done, just give me some kind of an indication that you're finished and ready to move on to the next step. And if you're not sure how to do that, there should be a little reaction button on the bottom right of your screen where you can give me a thumbs up to let me know that you're done or a heart, or you can just wave at me if your camera is on. But step number one is cut your pieces and I'm gonna label mine. This one is four inches by six inches. I believe, oh, this one is five and a half square. Is there anybody here from outside the United States who would be measuring in centimeters? <laughs> okay. So um, that would be about 10 centimeters by 15 centimeters. And this fits my standard sized Android cell phone. And this one's about 14, 14 or 15 centimeters. The nice thing about this is that your measurements are not actually critical um, as long as you've got a nicely cut square or rectangle, uh, you're going to get a nice weaving. If we were in my middle school classroom, I would have some nice instrumental hip hop playing in the background, but maybe we'll pass on that tonight. <laughs> oh, good, Robin's got his ready. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> And if Lee and Susan and Melisande and Katerina and Liz and Jocelyn um, and Lily, just give me some kind of an indication of whether you've got your cardboard cut and ready. So I don't want to leave anybody behind. Oh, good. Melisande's got hers. Liz has got hers. Wonderful. Oh, Susan's not doing the project, that's fine. I'm ready. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Susan. 
I don't have that little button because I'm on my phone. So oh, I, okay. I'll follow you and I'll only let you know if I'm falling behind. Terrific. And anybody who um, who wants to unmute themselves and talk directly to me, um, since I spend my days doing this, please trust me when I say I really like it when you unmute and just talk to me. <laughs> Otherwise, it gets awfully lonely talking to a screen with no reaction and not knowing if I'm going too fast or too slow or if people have questions. So um, please feel free to unmute and say, I'm ready or wait, I have a question because that's what I'm here for. And Lily, are you ready? Yes, yes. Oh, wonderful. How about you, Jocelyn? I'm just watching and taking notes. Thank you. Okay. Liz, are you ready? Hello? Okay, that works. And Mich Michelle, are you ready? Sorry, it took me a minute to unmute. Um, I'm doing the same thing. I'm just watching and taking notes. So um, Okay. And, I, and I'm still I'm finishing eating dinner, so no one wants to hear that. So I'm gonna go back <laughs> on mute. So <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I also appreciate that. <laughs> Excuse, me. Excuse me. Could you please spotlight the um, the camera that's on the pouches because it's jumping around as people are talking. I will. I'm going to pin that so we can see that. All right. Okay. I'm going to move ahead and I'm going to flip my um, I'm going to flip my chosen loom over. Um, just so that we can see it. So at this point, you're going to need um, your pencil. I'm going to use a pen because it shows up better in the Zoom. And you're going to need your ruler. And the first thing I like to do is I like to measure down from the top of the loom. And I like to measure down about an eighth of an inch or in centimeters, about two and a half to three centimeters. The number itself is less important than just making a mark down from the top, making sure your ruler is even and then drawing a line. And this is gonna be the line that shows us where to stop cutting when we start cutting in our loom. You're gonna do that at the top that's an eighth of an inch or two to three centimeters. And then we're gonna do that on the bottom. And we're just marking the depth of the cuts that we're gonna make when we start notching the loom. You do that on each side? Yep, apparently. Yep, you're going to do that on the top. Thank you. And you're going to do that on the bottom. And at this point, I'm going to mark the top of my loom just so that you can see when I start warping it, what's the up and what's the down. My next step is to start making marks along the top edge of my loom. And I want to make a mark about every quarter of an inch. That would be about every five centimeters. So about every quarter of an inch, make a mark at the top of the cardboard. Evenly spaced. all the way across the top. And 
when you finish that, you're going to go down and you're going to do the same thing at the bottom. Evenly spaced quarter inch marks across the bottom. My last little bit is not exactly a quarter of an inch, but it's close enough. And when you're done, it's going to look something like this. Now, when we begin weaving, we're not there yet, but when we do, we're going to be weaving first on the front and then on the back of our loom. And so the gap between the thread that would be in our first marking on the front and on the back would be a quarter of an inch plus a quarter of an inch, which is a little bit too far to go without weaving. So within the first mark at the top and the, the last one, you're going to just eyeball it and make an additional mark in half. You're going to cut that space in half. So at the end, on the right and the left, you're going to have one mark that is smaller and you're going to do the same thing at the bottom. Just eyeball that space and divide it in half. And that's going to help to minimize the gap when we're flipping our board over and weaving. And if that doesn't make sense right now, that's okay. It will make sense later when you're actually weaving. I'm just going to give everybody time to make your marks. What is the distance between your notches? It's a quarter of an inch. Oops. Okay. And I wrote an eighth of an inch because I'm silly and tired because I taught all day. Eighth of an there inch down, quarter of it's an inch between notches. Yeah, about an eighth of an inch down and a quarter of an inch between notches. And then after you have those quarter inch inches marked, you're just going to eyeball it. And at the beginning and at the end, you're going to, um, you're going to make the first and the second notches smaller at the top and at the bottom. Gonna give everybody a chance to make your marks and then just pipe up when you're ready for the next step. Ready? Ready. Ready. Oh, you guys are so much ready. faster than middle schoolers. I love it. <laughs> All right. Um, our next step is to get our scissors and we're gonna cut into each of our notches. And you want to cut, whoops, I cut too far there, but it won't make much of a difference. You want to cut and stop at that line that you drew from side to side so that it's not too deep. And you're just going to cut notches into your board at each of your markings.
then when you finish the top, do the bottom. There we go. And so I've cut into all of my notches at the top and at the bottom. And when you are ready, um, just pipe up and let me know. I'm going to look for my ball of crochet cotton. Ah, there we go. Okay. Can I use string? Yes. I don't the, lovely, have string. Yeah, the lovely thing about this is that you can use whatever thin, strong material you have around. Okay. Crochet cotton, pearl cotton, um, a lightweight knitting yarn. I take it rug warp would work really well for this. Oh, fabulous. Yes. That's great. I have buckets full. <laughs> and I have tons of the uh, I have tons of the crochet cotton from warping my ankle looms. <laughs> All right. So when we start warping our loom, um, I want you to leave about a hand's length of extra like length as waist and we're going to start at the top that extra is going to go down the back of the loom and you're going to pull it into the first notch on the top left side and then you're going to pull it all the way down in a straight line and through the first notch at the bottom mm -hmm. and then all the way back up to the first notch at the top and as we do this you're going to know that you're doing it right when you have a straight line from top to bottom and it will be straight on both the front and the back well it's like a rug is unweaving here yeah. a whole new world <laughs> Then when you've gone down the front and up the back and you've hooked back into that same notch at the top, you're going to take your string and you're going to go over to the next notch and you're going to pull it through. It's going to make a little dash. And you're going to take that string and pull it down the back, hook it in the next notch at the bottom and back up to the same notch at the top. And again, you'll know that you've done it right because you'll have a perfectly straight line from top to bottom on both sides of your loom. And then we're going to go over to the next notch, pull it tight, and we're going to go down and up. And that's our pattern. We're going to continue going over, down, and up. And as you work your way across, your strings are going to continue to be straight, Alexa, not slanted. Timer. 30 minutes, 39. 
And you're going to notice that you're making a dash pattern at the top of your loom where there's going to be, I'm gonna show you on one that's a little bit easier to see. Um, when it's correctly warped, your lines are straight and you have a pattern of alternating dashes and spaces that will go across the top of the loom. And so I'm gonna leave this one here where you can see it. And I'm gonna finish warping the one in my hand while you warp yours. When I teach this in school, I make my students use their rulers and make their own looms. But when I do this as a demonstration um, activity at fairs and festivals, I will have a box full of pre-warped cardboard looms in a variety of sizes so that anybody who wants to come can get a little cardboard loom and select a little bit of fiber and weave a small project. I have a question. Yes. What is the youngest age of children that you have taught this to? On a pre-warped loom, like something really little like this, which I call a tooth fairy pouch when it's done. Um, I've had four-year-olds who've given it a try. They don't have a very long attention span. And generally what happens is I send them home with a Ziploc bag full of um, a thick fiber with a 25 cent plastic needle and let a parent or a grandparent or somebody help them finish it um, at home according to their attention span. But I've had, my youngest student was a, a four-year-old who went around a couple of times before they got tired and were ready to go off and do something. But I'd say that um, about uh, maybe the, the prime age seems to be eight and up. And middle school age, so like those 11 to 13 year olds, um, this is a great project for middle schoolers. They're capable of making the whole board and um, it's a great thing for them to be able to do with their spare time. And having been a teacher for a long time, I can tell you that today's kids are so digital that they're losing their fine motor skills and they actually need things like that, like this, um, both to help develop their fine motor skills um, and their, their visual spatial skills and, and also their patience. Um, they're very used to immediate gratification. And so having something that requires some patience and some dedication to finish is a good thing. And so I have warped mine and I've left some extra strings hanging off the side. When everybody's ready, I'll show you what we do with these before we begin weaving. I'm just uh, looking for different uh, projects to do with the children at the upcoming Australia War. This would be perfect. And what I like about it is that it can be really cost effective. 
Um, I've never paid for cardboard in my life. I hoard it all year long and um, cut it into about the, the four by six makes a great size for a cell phone pouch. And then um, smaller ones for the younger children and we call them um, tooth fairy pouches. And a ball of crochet cotton will go a long way for pre-warping. And then for the kids, I find that um, heavier weight yarns are, are nice. So if you're actually gonna buy a yarn, I would think about um, maybe a worsted or double knitting weight. And for the younger kids, um, maybe even a little bulkier, as long as it'll fit through a needle for them. The younger kids do better with a thicker wool because it weaves up faster. Um, but older, older kids, um, older kids actually like having a lot of different choices. And I find this is great as a, a knitter and a crocheter and a weaver and an embroiderer. Um, I can't throw away my scraps. And so they all end up um, in a box where the kids can pick yarns out for themselves and wind little, um, wind little amounts to, um, if they stuff a, like a sandwich size Ziploc bag with um, three or four little wound up balls of color, that's usually enough to complete one of these pouches and still have plenty left for braiding a handle when they're done. Now this is an amazing way to use up your stash because I've got all these little things, yeah. <laughs> little balls of yarn from when I finished socks and it's like, what do I do with it? Yes, and I've actually had other um, other fiber arts friends who are avid knitters who can't bear to throw away, um, you know, sock yarn, custom dyed sock yarn that they paid twenty five dollars a skein for, and so they give their little tiny niblets of extra sock yarn to me, and my students are unaware of the fact that the gorgeous yarns that they're weaving with are are so expensive and that they're real wool, um, but they get great results. They they just they have so much fun choosing and mixing all of their colors. And nothing goes to waste. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm all done, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. Got it. What do you do at the very, very dead end there at the end? At the very dead end, you're, you're going to have these, these are secured in the notches and you're going to have two tails. And we want to tie some knots Sorry? in the tails. So I'm going to, I'm going to start on this side and I'm going to take this tail. Okay, I, have, I have to go back to monitoring this now. It's okay. I'm going to take the tail and I'm going to put it underneath this last string and then pull, it's got a loop out here and pull it through. And I'm just making a little knot here and I'm pulling it up tight at the top. And then I'm gonna do that one more time. So I'm lifting, knots. yeah, it's just a little slip knot. I'm lifting my string. I've got a little loop here and I pull that tail through its own loop. And then I leave this hanging down because as you're weaving, you will be able to weave over this. I'm, I have an aversion to cutting yarn or cutting string too short um, because I don't like the idea that it might break or pull out. So I always weave over this. And then I'm going to do the same thing on the other one. I'm going to turn my loom over and I'm just going to tie a little slip knot, tying a knot onto that last cord do it twice. I'm always distressed at the number of middle schoolers who don't know how to tie a knot. <laughs> but they learn in my class. And then at this point in time, we are ready to weave. And so I'm going to take out my little niblets of yarn that I have. And um, these are samples of yarn. My, my students in my class um, 
have no a <laughs> little to no experience with fiber. And so I ordered real wool and my students, half of them in Zoom and half of them in the classroom, um, got to choose packets of Kool-Aid and we wet our wool in some warm water and um, sprinkled Kool-Aid on it and wrapped it up in some, in some um, saran wrap and squished the Kool-Aid into the yarn and then stuck it in the microwave for a minute or two to heat it up. Ooh. And when it cooled down, these are actually skeins of yarn that my middle, this is the, rem the remnants that didn't get woven with that my middle schoolers um, made in class. And so if you're doing, if you have the ability to do this with kids, you can find, um, you can find YouTube videos about how to dye with Kool-Aid. And while they do tend to fade with time, as any mom can tell you, um, they're never fully going to go away if they get into a protein-based fiber, it's there to stay. And so it's a great non-toxic way of introducing um, kids to, um, to dyeing. And then these were actually dyed with the same packets of Kool-Aid. This student kept their colors separated and got reds and greens. And this student mushed them all together and got sort of a muted red. That's beautiful, actually, that maroon color. Yeah, even the kids who um, weren't good at keeping the colors separated or allowing for white space, um, there, there wasn't an ugly skein of yarn in the whole experience and they had a ball and the classroom smelled like candy. So couldn't ask for more. <laughs> so select your first length of yarn. And um, this is where I'm gonna do a demonstration. I'm gonna pin myself. When, well, maybe I'll do a description. Okay. When, I'm asked how much yarn to work with. Um, you should remember that you're going to be pulling this through a handheld loom with a needle and you don't want a lot of yarn, which is why this is good for scraps. And the ideal amount of yarn is if you were to spread your arms out straight and have the amount of yarn that you could hold in one hand and then cut off at the other hand that's the perfect length of yarn for doing this. It's enough to make some progress, but without having so much yarn that it'll continually get tangled. And especially for kids, they're, they're cutting them, their wingspan worth is, um, is a good amount of yarn to start with. And so I'm gonna start with um, a little bit more than a wingspan because my yarn probably won't tangle and thread up my needle. And you can use a tapestry needle or whatever is large enough to um, thread through. When I work with kids, I generally order colorful plastic needles from Amazon because um, you pay pennies for them and then you can send it home with kids. Um, and if they never come back to you, you don't have to worry. And when you're threading, um, you only want to double up your yarn for a few inches at the top and then let the rest of your yarn be a single. And make sure that as you're weaving with this that you're, you're holding on to the end of your needle and your double thread so that you're not pulling it out. And if I, please don't take it personally, I'm used to dealing with children. <laughs> so. I describe everything because I always assume that my kids don't know anything and it makes it easier than having 25 hands go up and say, miss, my needle came out, what do I do? All right, um, it doesn't matter. So if you're a lefty or a righty, you're gonna work from whatever side is comfortable from you. So I'm a righty, I'm gonna start on the right and weave towards my left. But if you're a lefty, you might be more comfortable starting on the left and weaving to your right. As long as you're doing it consistently, it doesn't matter where you start. So I'm gonna come in and I'm going to start going under and over my threads, under, over, under, over. And I'm picking them up with 
my fingers. And then as I get to where I can't do that or it gets comfortable, I'm going to start pulling the yarn through. But I'm gonna leave a little tail. And a rule of thumb is I like to re leave about a finger's length of yarn hanging. And then we're gonna resume in our pattern just under over, under over. <clears throat> and pull it through. And when you get to the end of your loom, you're going to flip it over. Oops. And you're going to resume weaving on the other side. If you end it with an over, do the opposite on the other side and start with an under. So it intrinsically will have, there's like one big spiral all around the board, right? Yes. <laughs> you are weaving in a circle and there will be no sewing or seaming because your sides are already created and we're weaving the bottom of our pouch. When you get to the second side of your yarn or the second side of your board and you're ready to flip over and you see what you've done on the front, at this point in time, it, you're going to use what you've done as your guideline. If, you're, if your yarn is under your first thread, you're going to do the opposite and go over. If it's over, you're going to do the opposite and go under so that we'll be weaving in opposition. And so I started with an under over. I'm going to go with an over under. Somebody at my house is watching something good on television. I can hear laughter from downstairs. And as you go along and you're building up successive rows, you're periodically just going to use your fingers like a comb to compress and pull the yarn down towards the bottom. And that'll be something that you're doing as you're weaving. And eventually, your warp threads, which is what we, we warped our board with, are going to disappear and won't be visible. So it really doesn't matter very much what color of 
warp yarn you're using, it's going to disappear under the weft yarn as you build up your bag. And the only time it doesn't is um, if you get a, chi a child who gets tired of weaving, but they've reasonably filled their board and reasonably packed their yarn. Maybe you see a little bit of the, the warping thread, okay. but they can still take their pouch off and, um, and have a nice bag with some structural integrity, even if their warp threads are still visible. Alexa, how many minutes left on timer? Okay. And I'm going to end my, um, my thread instead of finishing it. I'm just going to cut it. Um, so I can show you how to join a new thread. And again, I'm you. Bless you. God bless you. Oh, <laughs> you can hear me? Uh-huh. Are we on a 30 minute, are we on a 30 minute timer or 30 minutes from the end? I heard something about a timer. We're, we're not a, we're not under a time limitation. Somebody was privately uh, measuring. Oh, okay, it. okay, perfect. <laughs> I was thinking. Wait, I thought we had two hours. So I've got a bit of a question on mine now. It could be yes. I have too many strings, one too many strings. 
but going around once, I continue from going over a thread at the end, you go around the corner and you have to go under the next thread, right? Yes, but when, when you go, when you go in your first pass on the front and then you're flipping over, you're gonna remain in pattern. But when you get to the edge of the back, depending on whether you have an odd or an even number of notches. Mm -hmm. And if you're fussy, you can plan to have an odd number of notches so that you'll always be weaving in opposition. Or you, yeah, or I you can guess, plan to have an even number so that you'll always be in opposition. But if you have an odd number of notches, you may find that at the edge, you're gonna have, um, you're gonna go from an over and then to keep in the pattern, you're gonna have to do a double over. And trust me, I've woven so many of these, it won't make a difference at the edges. As long as you've got that, that smaller notch at the corner, um, where's one of mine? Because at one end, I'm gonna to have to go under yep. a couple of these. Uh-huh under one side and then you flip it over for the next row, yeah. it's going to have to go under to follow the pattern. Right, and if you look at this one, um, you can see the ridges and I have narrow, this is where my, um, my warp threads are under the string. And here mm -hmm. I was doing a double, over, double over and a double under. And you can see it at the edge when I hold it out like this. But when the bag is being used, you don't really notice it unless you're a weaver and you're looking for it. Um, and because I make so many of these so quickly or I'm warping them up quickly for, um, for children or members of the general public, I just don't get that fuzzy, that fussy about it. If I'm weaving something for myself, I do. And I'll always make sure that I have an even number of notches so that my pattern will be odd, even, odd, even, or over, under, over, under. But if you have an odd number of notches, you're gonna get that little doubled, that doubled area here on the sides. I two strings here. What's that? I seem to have an even number of strings. Then you're fine. You're gonna have, you'll the side of your bag will look, um, like this, this is the other side of the same bag, but you can see where it's, um, this gap here is not as big. It's, it's got, it's going under and over. So it's, it's, it's a little bit neater, a little bit tighter. But at the end of the day, it won't make, um, it won't make a, a difference in your, um, and the structural integrity of your pouch. Okie dokie. Yep. And when you are ready, let me know when you'd like to see how to join a new piece of yarn. And I'm gonna find a good contrasting color so that it's not pretty, but visible. I'm ready. Okay. So when you get to the end of your yarn, um, the best place to end is somewhere in the middle of your board, not at the edges, which is a little bit counterintuitive, but out here you can see what you're doing. Then you're going to cut yourself another length of yarn. And when you start weaving again, I'm not a fan of knots. I find that kids don't, because knots come untied. Um, they are bulky if you tie them in your string. And a lot of kids just don't know how to tie knots either. And it slows down this process if you're doing this with children, um, although not with adults. So instead, what I like to do is I like to come in and here's where my string ended, but I'm gonna go back a couple of threads and 
I'm going to copy the pattern that I had going here. So if I was doing an under, over, under, over, I'm going to follow that pattern and just weave directly on top of it. And when I get to where this string is, it's going to keep me in the opposition pattern with what's happening underneath. And so I'm just going to start weaving on top of my old thread and leaving a little tail hanging. About a, about a finger's length worth. And I'm sorry, I'm confused. Okay, I'm gonna hold it up so that you can see. So I ended my first thread. Uh-huh. I ended it here. Right. And then, but I, when I started my new one. Oh, you started the other way. I started, I actually come, I actually am going in the same okay. direction. Oh, okay. But I'm backtracking by about an inch. So go back okay. about four or five threads. And normally when we're doing this, we're weaving in the opposite direction. But when we're starting a new thread, we're starting it on top of an old thread and we're copying what the old thread did. So okay. I'm, so this was an over under and I'm doing that over under. I'm copying what the, what this thread did. Okay. And leaving a tail. All right. And leaving right. a tail. Yep. Sorry. Whoop. And then as you resume weaving, whoops, and I've slipped out of place. As you, as you resume weaving, um, you're going to go back into your pattern where you're going in you're doing the opposite. But what will happen is that as you're weaving around and you're compressing your layers of yarn, it's going to hide where that join is. And when we're all done, we're going to be taking care of those little hanging threads so that they disappear. So just keep weaving around your board in your pattern.
Oh no, I need to stop that. I got a ball of yarn that only has one end. Uh-oh. <laughs> Why is the setter? Okay, so in joining a thread, you do the same over and under as your first piece of thread, right? Yes, and you do it on top of that thread so that you're weaving over your first thread. There, you're overlapping it by about, whoops, by about an inch. And then when you get to where that thread ended, you're going to be resuming that pattern that it was knitting, that it was um, weaving in over and under. So you start out mimicking your old thread Got it. and then you're weaving in opposition. I have it, but does the, the yarn have it? <laughs> So I have a question. If you're using uh -huh. heavier thread, heavier yarn for your, not your warp, your weft. Your weft, uh-huh. Um, would you want to use heavier yarn for your warp or does it matter? I've never found that, it's, that it matters. Okay. So long as you're using a strong thread for your warp, which is why carpet thread or, um, a pearl cotton or a crochet cotton 
makes a great warp. It's because it's strong and it doesn't stretch. Okay. Oh, and I already found where I made a mistake because of a lapse of attention. I know this stuff can kind of hypnotize you after a while. <laughs> it does. And if you find that you've made a mistake, because I've done the same pattern two, row, two places in a row, um, it really, I, I'd say it depends on your personality. If that mistake is going to bother you, just go back and unpick your yarn till you get to the mistake and fix it but if you don't want to or if you're doing with this with the child just reassure them that they've seen their mistake and when you when you can recognize a mistake it means that you're learning and when you're learning you can avoid making that mistake in the future um, and just keep have them keep going around. They'll reestablish their pattern. And the worst that might happen is you might have a little glint of some warp thread throwing and a little, um, you know, a little place where the pattern deviates, but it won't make a difference in the structural integrity of the bag unless you get somebody who consistently does not alternate their over-unders and doesn't create that, that locking structure. And I did have um, I did have a disabled adult once who was doing so well. I got her started that I failed to monitor her, and she wove an entire bag without alternating her her threads as she went around. Um, mm -hmm. And God bless her. She enjoyed the process so much <laughs> that when we took her bag off and it completely fell apart. We rewarped the loom, the, the the loom, and she sat down and she immediately started weaving again. But this time she was doing the the pattern in opposition, and she completed a bag, which Excellent. was wonderful. <laughs> Is there a reason like with knitting, you don't work off a full ball or a skein of yarn while you're doing these shorter links? Um, mostly because you have to pull the, so much yarn through that the longer your working yarn is, the longer it takes to pull it through and that's wear and tear on your fiber. And also it increases the chance that you're going to get a knot in your weft thread and have to stop and, and untangle knots. So the shorter lengths just make it easier to avoid the knots and reduce the wear and tear on your fiber being pulled through the, um, the warp threads. Thank you. And my next question is, let's uh -huh. say I have some yarn and I wanna change colors. Uh-huh. I don't really want to change it like in the middle of a bag or in the middle of a, a weave. Right. And so in that case, um, 
that again, this, this is where it comes down to you and what kind of a person you are and whether you like things to be nice and tidy and orderly <laughs> or whether you want them to be more random. Um, and I have both kind of tendencies, you know, for this bag, I very intentionally wove with this crazy yarn and made a square patch in the center so I could have a little poof on the front. Um, and that's where you get to decide where you start and stop. If you do not want to start and stop a different color in the middle and have a little jog, just know that um, you can do it over towards the side, but you're gonna wanna do it um, close to the side where you're, where, so that you have room to um, join a new thread. But as they're compressing, if you look at this one, I did change colors. And like, I can see oh. that I changed color here, but you but really barely. have to, yeah, yeah you, you really have to look for it if you're just doing a striped bag. It doesn't really matter if you change colors in the middle of the bag, but you can stop and change colors. And um, I could turn this around and weave in the other direction and have half of my bag red and then half of my bag white and just always be interlocking threads here and if anybody is interested I can show you how you can um, start and stop randomly or create shapes like a vertical line because right now we've got horizontal lines but you can also do vertical lines hello Snoopy mm. oh come on big guy down you go. Mm. He's talking. <laughs> He's a movie star. He thinks his camera is here for him. He visits with my uh, my students anytime I have to zoom from home. That's funny. So I'm going to weave with um, two different colors to make a vertical stripe. Cool. So. I'm gonna stop here in the middle and I'm gonna leave this big loop so that you can see it. And I'm turning around and I'm gonna weave in the opposite direction. And I need some water. But I'm leaving this loop here so that you can see it. And I'm going to grab an obnoxiously contrasting color so that you can see the two. Okay, so I have some green, green and blue yarn to go with my lovely muted red. And so with the red, I'm going to be I'm going to be weaving on the right side of the bag, and I want to weave with my blues and greens on the left side, and I don't want there to be a hole in my weaving. So when I start to weave here, I'm going to bring my new yarn through the loop in this old yarn, and again I'm going to leave a tail. And now I can pull this. I don't want to pull it too tight, just firm. And I'm going to tap it down and I'm just leaving my tail here. And then I'm going to continue in my pattern, knitting or knitting, weaving in this direction. So this is another way to add in another color. Mm -hmm. okay. This is how you can add in another color, but create vertical stripes instead of horizontal stripes. Oh, okay. And so at this point, I really could be using two needles, one for my right side and one for my left side. I'm going to flip and I'm just going to make some length with, I'm going to just do some weaving with my green and blue yarn. And 
there's going to be one thread on each side and I'm going to color that thread so that you can see it. This is going to be the thread that both of my colors need to go over and under. And on the other side, I'm going to color this thread. And this is the thread where they'll be locking together. If I was not weaving both of my colors around this, I would be making a slot. It would be open. And so it's where they interlock over that thread that they're going to create the, um, the vertical stripe. And I'm just going to work for a little bit in my blue and green to start building up a column. You don't want to pull this tight. Um, if you ever start to see that you're pulling your threads this way, loosen up your thread. You want to be beating it down, but you don't want these threads to be um, to pulling be pulling outward. And then back at my, my pink thread that I marked with my marker. And I'm going to go over it and then turn around again. So you only have to interlock the first one. Well, we're going to be, we're going to be interlocking, but it's going to be because we're weaving over, oh. be weaving over these threads, but you can weave, like you can weave, um, a whole side of the bag and then leave the one other. side and then come back on the other side. But as you do, you'll be looking for these little loops and you'll be looking for this, this, um, this common string mm -hmm. so that you can be weaving into that um, so that you're creating connection instead of right. Holes. Okay. I got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, I have to try that next time. <laughs> It was funny when I was learning to knit, you know, she's uh -huh. like, you have to learn to knit a, a scarf, you know, <laughs> she got a dish rag and I'm like, I'm not going to use that. So I did a scarf and then she's like, okay, now we're going to do a shawl. And I'm like, I want to do socks. And she's like, no, you have to do this, this, and this. I'm like, no, I want to jump ahead and do the, you know, weird stuff. Uh -huh. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to try that now. <laughs> Can you do several? Um, several colors. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and again, this is, it's so flexible. You can be as orderly and planned as you want, like this little guy, or this one and this one, which are my artsy fartsy bags, which were completely random. I just stopped and started wherever I felt like it. Um, but they look so good. And then, you know, added my little, you know, made a little leaf and stitched it on. So it's totally up to your personality. Um, are you are you artsy fartsy or are you very planned and deliberate and orderly? And either way, you're going to get a bag that as long as you're choosing colors or textures that you like, you're going to get a project that is that's fun and appealing and can be a reflection of your personality. And if you want to be very period, you can you can use wool fibers and you can and natural colors or you can go and buy acid green or you can dye with Kool-Aid or you can use these crazy fuzzy um, contemporary fibers. There's, there's no right or wrong way to do it. Okay, Catherine, thank you. Yeah. It's are you chaotic neutral or lawful good? Right. <laughs> Where am I going wrong? 
Okay, Kim, where are you going wrong? After a while, I have to look away. Otherwise, all <laughs> these lines and their shadows start hitting me, and I can't tell what depth they are. Yeah. Um, one thing that can be helpful is if you um, if you have a sliver of cardboard or a popsicle stick that you can stick under this. Um, I'm going to demonstrate with a brush. You can create um, something to help you so that on every other row, half your threads are already lifted and it can help you to weave a little bit faster so that you're only picking up threads every other ro row. So I've got a, a paintbrush here and um, it just helps me go a little bit faster. And the only time I'll have to take it out is when I get up towards the top. Or those coffee stirrers that you get at um, some coffee places. can be very useful for this too. And I tend not to introduce them to the kids because they're just struggling with the whole idea of, <laughs> of weaving when they start um, and adding another complicating factor um, usually doesn't help the kids. Although adult weavers, I'll usually have a little package of popsicle sticks or coffee stirrers because those are a little bit longer and thinner and um, they're great help for adults who just are really embracing it and ready to go to town and speed weave. There we go. And remember to continue um, pushing your threads down so that you begin to cover your warp threads. You're gonna think you have a lot done until you have it, you start compressing it, but that compression helps with um, the structural integrity of your bag, as well as hiding your warp threads. I've decided that my next cardboard loom re weaving project that's for me, not for demonstrating for students, is going to um, be to weave a long narrow one and line it and insert a zipper in it and make a little pouch where I can corral all of my double pointed sock needles. Oh, that sounds cool. Or my, or my calligraphy pens, or perhaps one for each. All right. So and if I'm cardboard, if, if I'm weaving a, thinned. what was that? Note to self: Don't uh, use a corrugated cardboard if it's going to bend. Yeah. Uh, there's a there's a kind of corrugated cardboard that I like that is um, a little bit on the thinner side, um, and it's harder to find. 
Um, but if you're weed if you're weaving with corrugated cardboard, I like the corrugations to go to show up on the side, and I like to cut into the top because I can make it so that um, I get a slightly deeper cut. I can like plan so that my cut is right at the corrugation and then cut into it and it gives me a little bit more stability up here. It'll be easier to get your loom off corrugated cardboard than it is on the stiffer cardboard. Mm -hmm. um, the stiffer cardboard sometimes takes two adults. So don't use the nice heavy illustration or mat board. I actually, I use that all the time. It's oh. really useful. It's just harder to get it out of the pouch, get the pouch off of the loom if you're using that rigid board. I have to, you have to manhandle it a lot more and you might need a second person to, uh, to help you pull it off. But it's sturdy enough. Corrugated cardboard, I, I seldom get a second use out of. But um, scraps of illustration board and mat board, I can usually weave two or three times on a single pouch before it starts to get floppy. I guess it's kind of good to be able to use both and just be versatile. Yeah, and again, it, it also, if you're doing it with kids or you're doing it with members of the public where cost is a factor, use what you have. It doesn't matter if it's corrugated and it's a one-time use loom. If you're doing it for yourself and there's a size that you'd like to repeat um, and get a number of weavings off of before the cardboard starts to, um, to break down and you need to um, cut a new piece with, with fresher tabs, then by all means use the illustration board or a higher grade scrap cardboard that's got some rigidity to it. But it really depends on what you're doing and how many times you think you're going to use that particular size and shape of board. If you decide to, to um, make squares or rectangles or weave um, horizontal, excuse me, vertical stripes, um, don't, don't get too high on one side without coming in and um, looping into it from the other because you don't want to find that you're, that you're missing some of these and creating little holes. But if you're compressing what you're doing nice and tight over your warp thread, you probably won't get any little holes. It'll be nice and tight and any, any little dimples or bumps uh, will get hidden. Well, it's going to take me a while to fill up this board. Oh my goodness, my colors are hideous, but boy, do they show up well. Thank <laughs> you. 
So is there anybody out there who's getting a little bit irritated by all of those little loose fibers, those loose ends that are hanging on your pouch? Yes. <laughs> well, I'm gonna show you how to deal with those because while you can leave that you can leave them all hanging like this until you've done all of your weaving and that's fine um if you're like me and this untidiness gets on your nerves even when i weave a very random bag the untidiness kills me um you might want to be tucking those in and getting rid of them as you go along and that saves you a lot of work at the end so that you just have a lovely bag um, with very little finishing left to do. So well, I'm going to keep catching mine and the stuff I'm weaving with. So, yep. So if you will give me your eyes, I'm going to show you two different ways to deal with the tails in your yarn. So method number one for getting rid of your tails, you can do when you've got enough of your weft built up on top. Like I've got quite a bit of weaving probably a finger's width on top of this first little yellow tail here where I ended my first thread. And I can take my scissors and I can come and I can just snip it right close to the surface. And what's going to happen is that the weight of the weft on top of that is going to bury that tail inside the pouch. It's going to disappear and you're not going to see it again. But that's also why we've got a little extra where we were woving, weaving over this. And so that's gonna tuck it away. If that makes you nervous, the other way to deal with those tails is to weave them backwards. And I like to start, since these are rather short, I like to start with an unthreaded needle. Which one shows up? The purple one shows up better. And here's my tail and I was weaving in this direction. Um, so I'm going to manhandle my threads a little bit and I'm going to weave back in the opposite direction of where I was weaving. So this is where I started my new thread and I'm just going to weave under. And this is where a plastic needle is a little bit easier than the metal ones because there's some flex to it. I'm going to weave over and under a couple of threads and I'm going to shove oops, shove the end of my yarn through that large needle because there's not a lot of yarn here. I don't have enough to thread it and, and, and get it through. I just need to get it through here and then I'm going to pull it this way and I'm burying it under a couple of threads and then I'm cutting it even with the surface and when I compress my yarn it disappears and so the one yarn that you don't want to that you don't want to just cut is where you're joining new colors together vertically so for this thread, I would definitely want to be threading my little tapestry needle and weaving it backwards for a couple of threads. Oops. And again, feel free to manhandle that, that warp and push it up. And once it's woven back a little bit, then you can trim it flush. And you can see, even though my colors are hideous, um, you can see a strong contrast and you don't see 
my tails anymore. They're just buried inside the pouch. Cool. I put the thread up this way. What's that? The, uh, the, the tail, I just put it up and I thread through with the other one as I that go up. Work, that works too. Yes, you can mm -hmm. go, you can go up or you can go down and, and bury it. So I'm taking my very bottom one and I'm weaving it upward along where a warp thread would be, which is another great way to bury it. And then very carefully snipping it and then it'll hide itself away in there. And so now it starts to look prettier. There are less tails around.
So we only have about 15 minutes left. Is there anybody who's interested in um, showing the progress on their pouch so far? Because I've woven in extremely hideous colors, but that show up easily and are easy to see. I'd love to see what choices everybody else has been making for their pouches. Is there anybody who's willing to hold theirs up to the yeah. camera and share? Mm. Oh, wow, Lee, you're doing a beautiful large one. Oh, yeah, I think I'm just gonna have it all be- Robin, um, that's beautiful. Right. Is that a hand spun yarn, Robin? Is that hand spun? What, my stuff? Robin's. Oh, Robin. Who's Robin? He had a beautiful, um, it looked like a blue with little flecks of yellow in it. It really pretty. I was wondering if it was uh, hand spun. Oh, Lily, beautiful. You got, you got quite a lot on there. Well, my yarn, which pretty. Show up. I, love that. Weird I love that stuff yarn, on it, which was hard to weave with. Uh huh. But I thought it was really interesting. So. You know what? It'll it'll put beautiful textures into your pouch. It yeah. might be a little tricky to pull it through, but I love weaving with the textured yarns. Melisande, I saw a glimpse of yours. Let's see. Beautiful. These are looking really good. I'm not seeing anybody, but. Uh... Lilies. But here's mine. Oh, very nice. You made quite a bit of progress on yours. Yeah, I'm on my third bout, my third yarn. <laughs> Excellent. So on the class on Friday, the primary thing that we'll be doing is um, continuing to weave on these. And I'd recommend that you work on it a little bit between now and Friday so that you can work your way to the top. Um, because the main thing I'll be, the main new content that you'll get on Friday is how to get the silly thing off the loom um, when you're all done. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit about ways of finishing it so that if you're a knitter or a crocheter, there will be options. But if you don't do any of those things, um, I'll show you how to attach a simple, just do a simple braid and attach a simple braided handle to the top. Um, again, it's very easy. I do it with kids. And if, um, if a 10 year old boy can do it, we can all do it. <laughs> Yeah. And I love well, it when Friday. my 10 year old boys come back and say, I finished my pouch in the car on the way to football practice today. And now I'm weaving one for my mom for her birthday. <laughs> will Friday's class be recorded as well? Yes, it will. It will. Oh, oh good. Because I got conflicting classes. <laughs> <laughs> I know there are so many good classes this month. Yeah, Debbie is the best recruiter ever. <laughs> we are all very grateful for Debbie. February is my best pandemic month. Finally, things to do, people to talk to, stuff to look forward to. So keep pushing your... Uh weft thread down, right? Pack it down real tightly to hide all the warp thread. Yeah, you're just going to okay. keep packing it down because you can see on um, my most recent sample, you can't see that I, I had a, a sparkly gold thread on here. It's completely covered. So you're going to think you've made a lot of progress and then you're going to squinch it all down to cover your warp threads and, you're gonna, and then you're going to have to weave a lot more than you thought. 
but it's okay because again you're 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 building a pouch that's got some structural integrity to it and I wear I always wear one of mine um, around my neck so that when I'm at school I always have my my ID my debit card and my cell phone handy. Now the second class is it this Friday or? Yes, this Friday. Friday. Okay, great. Yeah. Same time, same 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 uh, bat time website, same bat, same bat time, same bat station. <laughs> For those of us who are old enough to remember Batman on syndicated television. I was going to say it is network. It is I watched it on network <laughs> television. Network. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some of us might only know Nick at night, but we still love Adam West. <laughs> That's okay. If you look on YouTube, uh, somebody did a, and I use this with my first graders and they love it. Mm -hmm. They did for the vowels, and uh -huh. they used the old Batman song, and it's vowel bat. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, my kids love it. Na 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 na. At yeah. this point, I'm going to say. At this point, I'm going to say that I win because I'm married to Batman. Well, my husband married? has the. Okay. I'm married to Batman. My husband has the Adam West costume, screen accurate, oh, that he oh. wears for charity functions. Oh, oh my one goodness! Of those. I love those guys. That is so and if awesome. he's not if he's not appearing as Batman, then I get to say I'm Mrs. Darth Vader. <laughs> <laughs> he's six foot four. Oh my goodness! Where do you oh. live? Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba, Canada. Oh my gosh, that's, that's amazing. SCA, I'm in the Barony of Castle Rouge in North Shield. Uh -huh. That North is Shield's amazing. Great. What a great group. There's a group here in Las Vegas, Nevada called Critical Care Comics and um, an alumni from the high school that I teach at who was a big comic book fan, she and a bunch of her comic book friends all made superhero costumes from their favorite comic book characters and they go to hospitals and they visit hospitalized children dressed up as comic book characters and they pass out age appropriate comic books um, to the kids and do photo shoots and 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 like meet and greets and little activities and read Aww, to them and so it's nice. you know what it does it makes the kids days our medical rules that, that we're you know, not just, allowed to just go into make the them hospital. So much better. Our, our medical rules are mm -hmm. such that we're not allowed to go into the hospitals, but we do uh -huh. things like walkathons and uh, charity picnics and stuff like that. Oh, I love that. I think I mean, might need to weave something pretty between now and Friday with, with all that free time I have when I'm not teaching, <laughs> yeah. when I'm not at my day job. My husband says I didn't watch TV anymore, I listen to TV. Yeah, pretty much. As a knitter, I can tell you that you can't knit lace while you're watching TV. No, you but I do shawls. <laughs> I do a bunch of, I knit a bunch of shawls uh -huh. and give them to the uh, Alice's Uggs, I think it is, for uh -huh. hospice care shawls. Oh, so it, wow. Yeah, so it's knit pearl, knit pearl kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, you can do it in your sleep. I do so, some with uh, emo and loose that while watching TV. And also staff meetings because, you know, Teacher staff meetings are not staff always, meetings. you know. <laughs> or playing yeah. pattern socks. Once I get it's on, until I get to the heel, and but the rest of the sock is pretty much knit, knit, knit. I have a teacher in service for half a day on Friday, and when you teach dance and, or music or art, um, generally the in-services only sort of tangentially appeal. Uh, they, they, they're not really discipline specific. Um, and I think I'm going to 
since we're doing it via Zoom, I think I'm going to be discreetly knitting while listening to the speaker oh, and participating yeah, in the participating in whatever the required activity is. I might work on this tomorrow because our uh, our weekly meeting got canceled. Mm -hmm. Because our team leader had is has to go to a uh, math workshop. But yeah, I'm the library specialist at our school, so I know, you know, most of the fees <laughs> don't, don't don't apply. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been very entertained in recent years um, as I've attended in services for teachers that all of a sudden they're starting to bring like how good it is to teach children to doodle in their notes and um, bringing the art, bringing arts and drawing into the classroom as ways of, of helping kids to retain things and or using, you know, creativity for um, for gaining depth of knowledge and understanding and it's like Art teachers could have told you that. <laughs> yeah. There was a, one kid who I read about who uh, did so many fantastic doodles in his notebook. Somehow, his, either his teacher showed them around or he uh -huh. wrote about it. And the kid ended up doodling over a whole wall in a restaurant. <gasps> they hired him yes. to, uh, to doodle on the walls professionally. I saw that okay. same article and let cool. me tell you that kid's not just a doodler. Um, he has a great sense of, um, of, of composition and oh, yeah, um, how to balance, yeah, how to balance out what he's doing. Well, I've been that telling my second and third graders this week. Uh, capabilities. What's that? He's got strong um, mental images of what he wants to do. Yes. He works with it. Well, I was telling my second and third graders this week if they finish up their poetry unit that they're working on that next month, we're going to do something completely fun because it, they'll be taking the uh, AZ merits test. Uh huh. And so uh, I says we're going to start it. Um, reading graphic novels oh they will love that yeah i had one kid who wanted to just quit and not work on his poetry and i showed him that i actually had them in my hand uh-huh and so and they're the dc comics and he he like all perked up so Reading is reading. Reading is reading. One of my children was a delayed reader and I, I would read her anything she wanted, but I would not read comic books or graphic novels to her. And that became her motivation to become an independent reader because those were the books that she really wanted to check out from the library and to read. And by golly, she did. It really got her, really got her reading quite well. And now she's going to school to become a comic book illustrator and storyteller and graphic novelist herself. Amazing. Yeah. Well, this lunch, this child that I was saying, you know, last year, mm -hmm. He flat out refused to pick up a book. Uh -huh. I take him over to the library. He'd, he'd you know, get all huffy puffy and mad. Mm -hmm. And I found a Star Wars book. Mm -hmm. And um, mostly graphic novel. Lots of pictures in it. So I had, I'd, I'd hide it. Uh -huh. <laughs> but nobody else in the library <laughs> at, at the school would get it. Uh-huh. 
And uh, so every week he, he could come in and he's like, can I have my book? I'm like, yep, here you go. Let me get it out. <laughs> Unfortunately, he was one of our kids whose parents wouldn't sign the waiver so he could take this home. So. Oh, that always makes me sad. I teach in a very poor district. Uh-huh. And our parents can't afford to replace the books. We have we have um, that problem here in Las Vegas. There are neighborhoods where parents don't want their children to have library cards because they they can't afford the fines if they're not able to get the books back to the library on time. Um, but then our district started doing an annual every April. Um, they'll do an annual debt forgiveness so you can come into the library return any overdue books during the month of April and they'll just wipe out all your library fines and my child who was the delayed reader who eventually um, could recite how many books how many videos how many um, computer programs you were legally allowed to take out at once and had a bag that was as big as her full every week. Um, they they knew her and they, they <laughs> the librarians at our little local library that we would go to would see her coming, but they knew she had been a delayed reader and they knew what motivated her to read. And when her books were late, they would just sort of make her fines go away <laughs> because they were lovely, delightful people. <laughs> Well, ours, you know, I set up our, our, how long the kids could have them. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, but they, their, their fines don't double or there's no, uh -huh. uh, you know, interest on it, but there is no forgiveness either. So it just follows the kid from grade to grade. Oh, that's hard. That's hard. Yeah. But we do have a lot of books donated from a couple of different organizations here in Phoenix. Uh-huh. And um, so during parent-teacher conferences on normal years, mm -hmm. I usually sit out in the, the lobby area mm -hmm. in our, well, we have a courtyard. And with like five or six tables full of books. And the kids all know they need to come find me mm -hmm. after they go into their conference and come get their book. I love that idea. And then we also have books donated for a birthday book club. Mm -hmm. so the month of their birthday, they get a book. And the kids are constantly telling me that, Miss, Miss, my birthday's this month. I'm like, yeah, I know. I, I owe you guys all books, but I just don't know when I'm going to get them to you. Oh, this has been a hard way, a hard year on the kids in so many ways. Oh, yeah. Been a hard year on the adults, too. Oh, <laughs> We're yes. all surviving. Yes, day by day. That's our big job. Yeah. I hear so many people talking about, well, the kids are falling behind. They're not going to be able to do this. They're not going to be able to do that. They're just sitting around the house doing nothing. And it's like, no, we are trying to live in a pandemic and stay alive. Yeah. Cut them some slack. They'll catch up. Oh, yeah. our kids, they have learned how to manipulate teams and they've learned how to take screenshots where they are, um, you know, looks like they're sitting at their desk working and they'll take a screenshot and put <laughs> that up as a photo and then take off and go watch YouTube videos. Yeah. No, they're not falling behind, they're ahead. <laughs> yeah. Don't let anybody fool you that these kids are behind. And these were our well, kids who, who learned how to do this. Not just our third graders. <laughs> mm. 
Well, yeah. In my, in my classes, I require my kids, their, their videos have to be on to start the class. They have to be fully dressed and they have to be at a table or a desk or someplace. They cannot Zoom in their pajamas from their bedroom. Uh, they have to be dressed, cameras on in an appropriate place. Um, and then once they're working, they can turn their cameras off so that they don't feel observed. Um, but if I call on them, I expect them to be there. Otherwise, I mark them absent and they get a note home. They learn pretty quick. But I have, I have good kids. Yeah, we have those rules too. You'll be surprised how many kids show up in their, banana, their pajamas. Yeah. Mostly because it's been too cold in their house. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, I know I live in Phoenix and it doesn't get too, too cold. Wait, but you guys have to remember, hell, it, 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 it did freeze um, a couple of weeks ago. It snowed. Uh -huh. Well, it's still winter and it gets very yeah. cold in the desert at night. Yes. We, even we who have been to Australia get it. <laughs> it was like 77 today, but you know, it's going to be down to the 40s tonight. Maybe, I think up to 50. You can start at 8 or 9 in the morning and it's still 40 degrees. They're going to be freezing their tiny butts off. And because I do teach in one of the poorest neighborhoods, the parents don't turn on their air conditioners or heaters mm -hmm. because they can't afford it. Right. So these kids are all wrapped up in blankets. Now, I was a homeschooler for many years. Uh, my oldest didn't set foot in a real school until he was in the seventh grade. And I can attest to the fact that kids can learn perfectly well in their pajamas and they can learn perfectly well up a tree with a book, and they can learn perfectly well sitting and waiting at the DMV working on math problems. Um, they are more versatile learners than we give them credit for. Um, as long as they're yeah. motivated and they're engaged, um, okay. there's so many ways that they can be learning. I have one of our kindergarten teachers, she, in trouble. she purposely tells her kids that on Friday, you know, if they work hard all week on Friday, uh -huh. they kids either have a dress up day mm -hmm. or pajama day. And then oh, they, I love that. they nice. do a democratic vote. Mm -hmm. So dress up day would be them wearing their, their clothes that they would go to church in. Oh, so dress up. So they get all fancy. My school has been trying to do things like that for our high school students, just to give them something to look forward to. Um, so they've been coming dressing as old people. They've been coming in their pajama bottoms. Um, yeah. Old people means that they come in, they look like me. Um, there was a day where they got to dress up as their favorite teacher. <laughs> <laughs> oh, or they get to wear their favorite college, because high school, their favorite college sweat t-shirts or sweatshirts, or their favorite sports teams. And I'm at a school where normally the kids are in uniforms. So um, yeah, it just- kids are too. Every little bit helps. Well, we have college Fridays, so every other Friday, the kids get to wear uh, college shirts. Mm -hmm. And it's usually dictated by whatever college the teacher graduated from. Oh, nice. <laughs> I went to an all women's college and I would just die to see my classes filled with people in my alma mater shirts. And we have big rivalries here with our, our two major universities, uh -huh. ASU and U of A. Uh -huh. And so, cause Please. we have one teacher who went to ASU and one went to U of A. So when they play football that weekend, whoever loses, they have to wear the opposite's clothes. So the kids, <laughs> kids do it too, they get the dance. <laughs> 
the one teacher, she, when she was teaching the kindergartners, she had her kids that, that Friday would all dress up in new bay clothes, all the colors and everything, and they'd have praise. Wherever they went, they were all shouting. You love it. So it was it was hilarious. It's nice talking with everyone. Um, I do have to go. Oh, yep, and it's nine o'clock. And that means it's getting close to my teacher bedtime. Because I teach high school in the morning and I start at the crack of dawn. Yeah, I do mm. too. It's an hour past mine, so <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, I thank all of you for joining me. Um, I hope that you had fun and um, I look forward to seeing you back on Friday to finish these pouches off. Um, thank you for joining us. And anybody wanna show their progress? Anybody's has gotta be prettier than mine with my, my very visible colors. But ugly makes for ugly makes for good demonstrations for for teaching purposes. Hey, the Vikings would have loved it, Kim. Oh, I love that. That's beautiful, Robin. I love Robin's yarn. Robin, yours is my favorite do, yarn. Do you want me to remove the spotlight so we can see more? <laughs> oh of yeah, that would be things? perfect. Yes. Okay. And well, thank you, you, Kim. I'm going to start over because I've got some really cool yarn I want to use. I'm going to start over. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Can't wait for Thank Friday. you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. See you Friday. Bye. Bye. Friday. Bye. Good evening, Robin. Good evening, Lee. Lovely to see you, Miss mm. Lee. Yeah, well, life sucks sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I say that my husband passed away last month, so oh. I'm still trying to figure out why I'm still here. So yeah, lots of challenges ahead. Like, where am I going to go to live? How do I sell this car? Which we still still owe five thousand dollars on because we just got it a couple of years ago. And well, you might go to the car dealer and and explain it and see see what they say. I mean, they might not have anything helpful to say, but they might. Yeah, well, I have one friend who says she might want to buy it, but then I'm not sure she's going to have the money for it. So I don't That's know. That's an issue. And I'm just trying to get paperwork and Kaiser dropped the ball on, on me and now I'm without my medication because they really messed up. So I don't feel good. <laughs>